to the worm in the cheese, the cheese is the universe. To the maggot in the cadaver, the cadaver is infinity. And to you, what is your world? How do you know what is beyond the beyond? Most of us don't even know what is behind the beyond. now positioned behind a two-way mirror in the dressing room of this shop. The women you will see have no idea they are being photographed. The mirror does not have the usual black backing and from our side, which remains in darkness, the mirror functions as a window. According to William Shakespeare, the most divine aspiration of the human body is love. But in this bizarre world of ours, love takes many forms, some of them very, well, bizarre. This is Nassau, capital of the Bahamas, a small clutter of islands, 3,000 in number, belonging in the British Commonwealth. The principal industries of Nassau are providing tax-free havens for United States corporations who wish to avoid paying their share of the cost of government, and providing vacationing Americans a way of spending their money quickly, easily, and comfortably. There is also a small basket weaving industry. But we are not here to talk of industry. These people are the descendants of slaves. Today, they are civilized members of the community, educated and responsible. But for some, there is still a yearning for the freedom of spirit and abandon of the past. Our quest has brought us to Nassau because this is one of the last places in the Western Hemisphere where the ancient black arts of voodoo are still practiced. Our cameras were hidden in the hills of New Providence only three and one half miles from Nassau. These people gather religiously every Thursday to indulge in a most frantic and depraved form of worship. What you are seeing here is fortunately a highly revised version of the original terrifying ritual. In the good old days, for example, a white baby would be kidnapped for sacrifice. At the peak of the ceremony, the child's body would be dismembered by clever manipulations of the machete, and arms and legs would be thrown into the air in the hope that the Lord God Dumballa would be pleased and smile upon them. But we'll see none of that here tonight, for after all, these people are civilized. The ceremony begins with the lighting of the sacred fire, symbol of Dambala's passion. An important part of the sacrament is rum and ganja, the latter being none other than simple marijuana. came to these islands over 200 years ago. The raids on the African slave coast began about 1742 and thousands of these believers were sold into the West Indies and later further northwest to the Bahamas. Rum and ganja hastened the elevation of the mood to spiritual heights. At the proper moment, when the participants are in the required um, spiritual mood, the voodoo king opens the ceremony. The queen, or mama as she is sometimes called, officiates at the ceremony. 
The ceremony gets underway with the beheading of a chicken. serpent of evil, the zombie, or in this case a small boa constrictor, is next to be sacrificed. In this state they can commit no evil, commit no sins, they can do no wrong. the old laws of voodoo have changed, the old hexes, grigris and dolls with pins have fallen into disuse, the primeval sensuality and spirit of wanton abandonment remain. And now we journey to the distant Orient, the inscrutable East, Land of the Rising Sun. The Japanese Empire has 33 active volcanoes and to service its 96 million people has 534 colleges and universities and 7,220 massage parlors. This is Kyoto. This is one of the many massage parlors in the city. With permission of the management, we have installed hidden cameras in both this reception room and one of the massage booths. Our curiosity in Japan and its numerous massage parlors was prompted by a growing interest in what is commonly referred to as the special massage. There were 14 massage booths, each about 12 feet square. A hole was cut through the thin wall of an adjoining massage room where our camera was placed. A two-way mirror was hung over the hole. It is now possible for our camera to see through the mirror into the room. In addition to culture, Kyoto is also one of the key manufacturing cities in the Japanese Empire. It is, for example, one of the largest exporters of women's undergarments in the world. And this is one of the most successful mail order operations in the United States, with headquarters in Hollywood, California. Founder and president of the organization is Mr. Frederick, a man whose unique design capabilities have made him the most successful underwear salesman in the world. This mail order operation has grown to be one of those remarkable American success stories. We asked Mr. Frederick to tell us about his fantastic organization in his own words. We felt the B cups might want to look like C's and the C cups like D's. And we found that we weren't wrong. Also, our specialty items add a great deal of interest in our catalog. We developed the hole in the middle bra for the same reason. We make periodic quality checks using live models with known sizes. The Frederick's catalog is sent to all of our customers six times a year at a yearly postage cost to us of $150,000. 90% of our customers are women, 60% of whom are married, and of that group, 50% had two or more children. Our mailing list consists of over a million names and we service people in over 71 foreign countries. Our mail order department employs approximately 300 people. All mail is open on the day it arrives. If it gets in early enough, it's possible for the item to be on its way to the customer the next day. Frederick's is an industrial symphony, a medley of machinery, letters, and underwear. <laughs>
If the human spirit is divine, as Dante said, then the temple of that spirit is the human body. We journey now to Sydney, Australia, to witness a demonstration of the mysterious powers of the mind and their effect on the human body. These members of the press and the medical profession are gathered here at the University of Sydney to investigate the claims of Jack Schwartz, a Dutchman, who has the amazing ability to prevent disease and infection in his body. Mr. Schwartz makes no claims to be a mystic or a fakir. He is, he says, just an ordinary person like you or me. However, he has learned to control and use the magic powers of his subconscious mind through meditation, so that he only requires two hours sleep per night. He eats only three full meals per week. Yet he is just an ordinary man, as you or I. Mr. Schwarz claims that he makes no use of self-hypnosis in controlling his body, but relies more on a positive method of concentration, which might be referred to as a mental local anaesthetic. The principal device for his experiments is a bed of nails. This bed of nails contains only 17 very rusty nails. The traditional bed of nails of the Indian fakir numbers between 40 and 80 nails. The fewer the nails, the deeper they penetrate the flesh. In addition, these nails are in no way sterilized. And for those who are skeptical of the slow exertion of 242 pounds on Mr. Schwarz's stomach, we offer a 50 pound boulder which will be struck with a sledgehammer creating an instantaneous impact reaction equal to 750 pounds. examination by doctors confirms that a complete penetration of the flesh has been achieved, yet no blood has been drawn, and the wounds themselves will be totally healed within a half hour. How does he do it? By directing his mind, he says, in a spirit of meditation to the affirmative emotions of life.
where in all this marvelous, amazing world can we find life more bizarre than in your own front yard? Sixty years ago, this was the small, sleepy western town of El Pueblo de Nuestra Señora de Los Angeles. Today, it is the sprawling megalopolis of Los Angeles, the largest city in the Western Hemisphere. Nowhere in the world are there more automobiles. Nowhere has growth been more continuous. Has the urban sprawl been more persistent? Have the wide open spaces been more completely devoured by the unending influx of outsiders migrating here for the good life? Fifty years ago, these houses would be standing on vacant land interspersed with vast groves of orange trees. Today, the motor car dominates life in Southern California. This is Sunset Boulevard, legendary street of dreams and myths. Young people from all over the world are drawn here by the glamour of the film industry. For this is Hollywood, now just a small section of Los Angeles. Here are the fabled clubs and watering places of the celebrated. Nearby are the apartment houses and homes for those who work in Hollywood. It is here in this great Los Angeles basin that we find the elusive search for love and fulfillment taking forms never dreamed of by Michelangelo, Shakespeare, or Dante. This is Main Street, only eight blocks from City Hall. Our camera is concealed in a bakery truck. We are watching two homosexual male prostitutes waiting for the first contact of the evening. <laughs> Soliciting is against the law here. One has to be cautious in selecting a companion for the evening. Enlargements of still photographs taken at this time indicate that the driver of the car is a male. certain that you aren't being watched. Ah oh well, perhaps next time. La Cienega Boulevard in Beverly Hills might well be considered the Greenwich Village of the West. On this street, one may find a painting to suit every mood, to fulfill all desires, and to fit every pocketbook. Sir Julian Huxley once said that the role of the artist is to provide variety to our lives. Thus, our lives are enriched and ennobled. Los Angeles has become the cultural center of the West. These paintings present a traditional approach to the artist's creative vision. Prices for these paintings range from $100 to about $1,000.
Almost directly across the street, we find the works of modern artist Ellsworth Kelly. This painting is priced at $5,000 and is cleverly entitled Red and Blue. This work is priced at $6,000. It is entitled Red, Green and Blue. The creative experience takes many forms. This theater houses another collection of the West's cultural heritage. This 60-foot tower was created by sculptor Marc de Suvero of New York in protest against America's involvement in the unpleasantness in Vietnam. A committee of artists contacted painters all over the world to participate in this protest. Over one million dollars worth of paintings created by 200 internationally famous artists adorn the exhibit and give voice to their indignation. Dedication ceremonies heard veterans of the Vietnam War add their voices to those of the artists. Protest, oh, it's the thing to do. There must be something bugging you. Protest, we're gonna start the day. So get out the signs on the picket lines and leave the way. other voices, too. Counter pickets stage a protest against the protest. The Young Americans for Freedom vigorously support the government's position in Vietnam. The signs they carry represent no artistic endeavors, and at present market prices are totally valueless. But the messages they contain are most assuredly definite statements of their beliefs. turn inspires a counter-protest against their protest of the artist's protest. If this seems confusing, try to bear with us. For after all, this is part of the variety that the artist contributes to our lives.
An old Oriental proverb says, the more life changes, the more it remains the same. The tower is gone. The arguments have been hot and impassioned. On this day in Vietnam, 37 Americans lost their lives, while here, only a small echo of protest could be heard. Protest. Oh, it's the thing to do. There must be something bugging you. Protest. We're going to start today. So get out the signs, form the picket lines, and lead the way. We're going to save the world. We're gonna save the world. Art in Los Angeles is by no means restricted to the professional. This art class is at this moment attended solely by housewives, most of whom are aged over 40. It is not, however, a prerequisite that you be a housewife to enjoy the advantages of this particular class, or for that matter, that you be over the age of 40. It is only necessary that you apply yourself to the full development of individual artistic expression. sculptor and the figure that you see here is a glass construction entitled Bending Dancer. I cut out photographs of girls and paste them on pieces of glass and I glue the pieces together onto the figure which is two-thirds life size. I also do more conventional kinds of sculpture. This is my protest against prejudice and intolerance in the world. I believe that we should love one another rather than hate. I believe in peace rather than war. I try to put that into my work. I consider myself as a deviate from the norm. The sprawling megalopolis of Los Angeles offers a variety of hedonistic experience. This is Balboa, a playground for millionaires and just everyday folks like you and me. Once a year, a strange mating rite takes place on these seemingly innocent shores. For just as the seals return annually to the Bering Straits and the swallows return to Capistrano, so do tens of thousands of young teenagers converge on Balboa at Easter time to indulge their youthful energies in drinking, dancing, flirting and, well, just about everything else. Here, beyond the watchful eyes of parents and school authorities, they learn the facts of life 
in their first awkward gropings towards maturity. The small police force is reinforced to many times its normal complement. State highway troopers and officers from communities all over California help to at least control, if not subdue, the youthful vigor of the teenagers. Every vehicle is pressed into the service of the police, including even the dog catcher's truck. Roadblocks are set up at major approaches, and suspicious-looking vehicles are searched for alcohol or drugs. Hundreds are arrested, the charges ranging from drunkenness to indecent exposure. In order to better understand this modern mating ritual, we interviewed some of the participants. Where did you come from? Las Vegas, Nevada. Did you drive down in your own car? Yes, we did. Where are you living while you're here? We have a room, motel room. How many of you share the room? Fourteen. <laughs> have you had any parties since you've been here? Every night. When are you going home? When the money runs out. How much do you pay for this uh, motel room? About 70 cents a piece, 85 cents a piece. How old are you? How old am I? 18. Has anybody been down here the whole week? I have. Yeah. I'm, down, I'm down here every day, every year. The cops haven't gotten you yet? yet? No, not yet. you expect the cops? Uh, yes, I do. Isn't this what? Yet before? I always expect them to get me. I got a ticket the other day. What for? For riding in the back of a cheap hanging Yeah, we, we, had to, we had to pay for this guy's ticket. Did the police give you much trouble generally? Yes, I hate them. What, what do they give you trouble about? I know, they yell at you for walking down the street the wrong way. I know, I hate them. No, you didn't there. anything and you get in trouble. You have my knobby? Look, well, let me see. All right, okay. want to see my knobby? Tell Sue to find it, you see. I'm not going in the Army for them. Why? Because you can't wear boots, right? Yeah. Better than being a conscientious objector. But what are you doing for a living? I don't do anything. Well, how do you exist? Oh, well, we go down to the beach there, and uh, you can clam dig Saturdays and just take it over to the market. They give you steaks for it. And uh, what about a uh, place to live? How do you exist? Oh, well, there's a uh, number of guys go together on one place, and it doesn't cost that much. Can you? What does it cost you? Oh, four dollars a week. Do you stay down here any nights? Yeah. Where do you stay when you stay? The beach. You sleep on the beach? Yeah. That sounds great. Yeah, it's fun. Do the police give you any trouble? No, they don't bother me because I don't let them. Well, how do you not let them? Because if they talk to me, I just plug my ears and say, don't talk to me. And, they, and then they just leave you alone from that point, is that right? Yeah, because they think I'm nice. Last night, the cops are always bugging guys. Why is that? I don't know why, man. They don't respect the guys. All the kids respect the cops, but the cops don't respect the kids down there. There's two cops here and two cops there and all over, man. What do you want to do for a living? I don't know. How old are you? <laughs> 18. What do you do for excitement? <laughs> Sir, usually sit down here and play my guitar. Where do you go to school? Phoenix, Arizona. Did you come out here just for the Easter week? Yes. It can be kind of a drag. I'm glad I'm going home. <laughs> Phoenix is better. Well, no. I think I'm going to New York next time I go on a vacation. Watch out, New York. You may be next. <laughs> But lest we become too involved in horrors of the past, let us now appraise the bizarre of the here and now. Our quest next takes us to distant Lebanon, bordering on the blue Mediterranean. Let us hear from Mr. George Fillmore, a member of the Arabian Expedition team via transatlantic telephone. Uh, we picked up this Arab uh, who was to guide us to the slave trading area and uh, drove all night about 119 kilometers out of Beirut. It's wild country, no roads to speak of, no maps, uh, telephones, nothing. And uh, we only had this Arab's word to go by. We were a little strung up about the situation because Muslim law is very strict. They shoot slave traders on the spot and of course they consider us infidels. This Arab uh, his name was uh, Fuad. He showed us the place to uh, set up our cameras. So way up on the side of the mountain, uh, looked very steep. And uh, he also pointed out to us uh, the spot that the slave auction was supposed to take place in. He showed us where to unload our equipment. And um, of course, we had little, uh, little choice to, but to follow him. We unloaded the equipment very fast. Uh, the sooner we got it out of the van, the safer it was for us. Uh, there was an awful lot of it, uh, not just camera gear, but uh, 
Some recording stuff, cables. Well, we had a lot of hauling to do. And there was a few heavy things, like the uh, big pulley rope uh, to get it up the mountain. After that, we drove the empty van out of there and around the other side of the ridge, where it would be out of sight, but uh, still handy, just in case we had to scarper over the ridge to, uh, to get out of there. Now that I'll think of it, it wouldn't have been much use. It would have, uh, would have probably been a, a rotten carve up. Fuad helped us lash up the equipment securely to the sled. We had brought the uh, bare minimum, but it still seemed like a ton. We tied on a few extra ropes, just in case. And uh, in the meantime, the van was being hidden just over the, the other side of the ridge. We needed a volunteer to go up the mountain, and uh, I was the lucky one who was selected. I was was fairly easy at the beginning, but I I soon found out that uh, we were going to have a problem because uh, it was all loose gravel up there, and you know uh, you take two steps up and one step back. It uh, was actually easier going up on all fours. It was very frustrating, and uh, I seemed to be making no progress at all. However, I. I knew the clock was ticking and uh, we just had to get on with it. I think we were all getting nervous now because uh, we still hadn't got the stuff up the hill yet. I fastened the rope around the tree and uh, I started back down. It was very loose and slippery on that hill and, and that's when I lost my balance. I thought me numbers up. But uh, as it turned out, I, uh, I just winded myself and uh, I got a bit of a scrape on the leg. A few moments later, I was back at it, uh, pulling on the rope to get that equipment up the hill. Time was against us. We set up the camouflage net first. Uh, we had a definite plan to follow, and uh, we more or less followed that right to the letter. We had three cameras. Uh, one was a spare, and we used that just to uh, photograph ourselves setting up the equipment. One camera had a 1,000 millimeter lens that was so powerful, you could almost pick up the airs on a flea's back legs at about a mile and a half. Uh, we, we got it set up while Fuad stood watch and uh, kept his eyes skinned. We'd also gotten hold of a Morrison senior teledynamic microphone. Uh, we got it from the military. It's got a tremendous range. You can focus it into an area up to uh, two and a half kilometers away. It'll uh, pick up the sounds and bring them back. It's really unbelievable. After quite a lot of work, we got uh, all set up and ready to go, and then it uh, was my job to cross the ridge, find myself a nook over there, and uh, act as lookout. The country is rough, very, very barren, and it's dry, actually, it's very dry, and uh, it's just crazy to be out there. I was in a position to see him coming, and as soon as I saw the first truck at about 1.30 in the, uh, in the afternoon, I waved, and then I ducked down, and um, I, I kept out of sight. to atmospheric conditions, we were unable to pick up all the sound with the teledynamic microphone. The great distance from the source caused the sound to be somewhat delayed. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
This will be no ordinary slave auction, for this is royalty. However, discretion compels that we obscure the license plate, lest we offend a friendly country and precipitate an international incident. Slave trading in this area is one of those great open secrets that no one talks about. It has been estimated that more than three million Lebanese pounds are spent annually for the purchase of human flesh. That is about one million American dollars. Unlike the slave trade in America, in the 1800s, these slaves are not intended for uh, manual labor. Rather, they will probably find their way into the brothels of the Middle East, where they will provide the physical incarnation of love. It is true that the human body is, in Michelangelo's words, the form divine. However, such is the atmosphere of prudery and repression in our own country that we cannot reveal this scene as our cameras saw it. To the worm in the cheese, the cheese is the universe. And to you, dear friend, what of your universe? 